is are elements of the inner world. I mean, uh, understanding the inner worlds of, of, of others. These are parts of our imaginations. These are parts of the simulations I was talking about. Let's start with uh, imagining the emotions of others, that is, empathy. Um, there is fairly clear evidence for empathy in, in mammals. The typical experiment is that you have a rat in a typical Skinner box. The rat presses, presses a lever and gets a, a reward, a food pellet or something. Then after a while, the rat learns this readily, and then after a while, you place another rat in, in, in an adjacent box. And each time the first rat presses the um, uh, lever, the other one gets a small electric shock and, and, and makes a squeak or whatever. There is a, some kind of uh, nasty thing happening to the rat in the other box. And the first rat continues to press the lever to get its reward. But after a few times, and I really mean a few times, it stops. It abstains from getting its own reward, because it realizes that each time it presses its lever, the other one gets uh, a, 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 a shock, something, something unpleasant. So it, it avoids, it abstains from, from its own reward in order not to punish the other one. And this is seen as a kind of criterion of, of empathy. And there are all kinds of variations of, of, of uh, this experiment, experiment, which I won't go into. But fairly clear evidence for empathy in the mammals that have been uh, investigated. There are speculations among scientists that this depends on mirror neurons. I mean, the real role of mirror neurons is not to, uh, is not to imitate the behavior of others, but just to understand the... Um, the uh, emotions of others, that's the primary role. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I can evaluate this claim. Uh, researchers also make a distinction between empathy and cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy is more, uh, is more advanced. That is understanding that somebody else is happy or sad or in pain without getting the emotions yourself. I mean, empathy is really mirroring the emotions. If somebody is sad, I get sad. If somebody is happy, I get sad. But if you're a therapist or a doctor, you have to have this capacity of cognitive empathy, uh, otherwise you couldn't work as a professional. You have to detach yourself from the emotions of the, uh, uh, the other uh, individual. Um, as far as we know, this cognitive empathy only exists in humans. Uh, chimpanzees have a little bit more advanced form of, of empathy. They don't only understand that somebody else is in pain or is afraid or, or but they also try to do something about it. They try to console the one who is suffering, which is some kind of insight that if I help you, if I come and give you a hug or whatever, you will become less sad than you are, you are now. So that's a little bit more advanced than, than just having the uh, empathy. Um, here is a picture I took at the Cape Good Hope of a baboon mother her uh, juvenile and a newborn baby that was, that was dead. Uh, this is really newborn. And she was carrying it. This dead uh, baby could, of course, not cling to, to his or her mother, but she was carrying it by the tail. And, and, and when she stopped to eat from a bush, she put it down, and when she moved on again, she brought it in the tail. She showed no feeling of distress. No, no, she was just as calm as, as normal. Somehow she carried this infant. And the interpretation, I mean, this is only an anecdote, but the interpretation is still that she had no understanding uh, that this little baby didn't have any, any consciousness, wasn't present, and so on. She treated it. She wanted, kept it with her. And I don't know for, for, uh, for, for how long. So this is, I mean, I shouldn't say it's really a case of emotions, but still, it's a lack of understanding the, the mind of, of the little baby here. Then we get to the next capacity, that is uh, representing the attention of others. And in the literature, this is very much concerned with following the gaze of, of, uh, of others. I mean, you, understanding the attention of others is, is important in a social society, is in a social species. Uh, because if somebody is looking at something, it's either because there is something there, there is there is something interesting. It could be food, it could be a danger or something. So if you can monitor the gazes of others, you get benefits yourself. Uh, so we see this in some some social uh, social species, not not too many. We see it in in, in the primates. We see it in dogs, wolves, and, and goats. Uh, these are the animals that have been tested for, for gaze following so far. I mean, I, we don't know exactly who who can follow the gaze. If we look at the development of children, I mean, look at the development of understanding of attention. Already, very small children can follow the gaze of the mother. I mean, the, the experiment is that. 
somebody sits with the baby in, in, in his lap, and the mother sits just across, and the mother starts looking at things in the, in, in the room, and if the mother turns her head, uh, the, the, the baby will follow the gaze of the mother to, the, to the, where she's looking. Uh, if she only turns her eyes without moving her head, small children can't do it, small babies can't do it, you have to be about 12 months in order to follow just the gaze. By the way, in the primates, humans are the only ones who have white sclera. If you look at the sclera of, of uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, and they are reddish or brownish, we also have almond-shaped eyes. Uh, the other great apes have round eyes. So we get much more precise information from the position of the, of the iris than we, the other apes do. And we are much better at reading the, the direction of the gaze of, of an individual than the other apes are. But they still can do it. So we have an anatomical difference that is interesting in, in following the intention of, of, of each other. Uh, there is an idea that we use this for collaboration. And humans are much more collaborative than the other, uh, the other uh, great apes. Coming back to the children, uh, at 18 months, the, they can follow the gaze of the mother, even if she looks outside the visual field of the baby, if she looks at something that is behind the baby, the baby will then turn around and look for the thing that the mother is, is looking at. If the baby is only 12 and the mother looks behind the baby, it will not turn around. What's happened here, and this is quite interesting, I'll come back to that, the small child only has an egocentric space, that is, Everything that exists is, is, within, is within sight or within hearing. Of course, we know that. They, but they can't imagine that there are things, they don't think about things behind them outside the visual field. When they're 18, they've developed this notion. I mean, you make a distinction between an egocentric space and an allocentric space. I mean, it's a, a space outside uh, yourself. So when they're 18, they've developed this allocentric space and they know that people can look at things that are outside your space. Chimps can follow gazes that are outside their own space. You place a chimp behind a desk like this, the experiment looks at the point of, uh, down there, the chimp will look up and look in, uh, at the point like this, because it understands that the experiment is looking uh, uh, in the allocentric space. Uh, I don't know if this, is, this allocentric thing has been tested for other, other, other species. But this is quite interesting, the, the transition from an egocentric space to an, to an allocentric space. So that's something about representing the attention of others. If you can do this, okay, I, I already said this, that they can follow it. If you can do this, you can deceive, because you can use the information about the attention of others to get favors on your own. And this is an, 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 an uh, observation that was made in, in a baboon troop. This is the alpha male. In, in reality, he's sitting further away, but the, the, the person who drew this picture put him here. And this is a young female. And this is a subordinate male in the troop. And the young female is interested in this uh, subordinate male, which, among, among other things, one means that she wants to groom this one. But if the alpha male sees that she is grooming the, the subordinate male, she will the alpha male will chase away the subordinate male, and they will, he will break up. So what she was doing, she was sitting some three, four meters away from this rock where the, alpha, the younger male was sitting, and then she moved very slowly towards the rock, all the time monitoring the gaze of, of, of this guy. And he, somehow she understood that he could not see what was going on behind the rock, and she managed to get up close to this young fellow and start grooming him without he noticing what she was up to. But the interpretation is that she could understand that he could not see what was going on behind the... So this is a form of intersubjectivity here. I understand that you, you can't see here. I see that you don't see. You, she has to somehow form a, an image of his visual field. So this, is, uh, this kind of deception builds on, on this form of intersubjectivity, of understanding the attention of, uh, uh, of others. Let's get to intentions then. Here the situation is very unclear, and the experimental paradigms are, are in my opinion, rather weak. What you, what you see is, is uh, experiments where you have an adult, you can do it with babies, uh, infants, 
not babies, infants, 